Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome to You've Championed Yourself. Who are you? I'm Chris Ferguson, your host. It has been a dream of mine to showcase ordinary people doing extraordinary things in life for themselves and for others. Those who have taken their dreams and ideas and turned it into the reality. It's that courage that these champions have. They reach beyond their personal struggles or personal pains or personal traumas where so many people give up and lose hope. There are the few that can walk through their obstacles and challenges, not knowing where it's going to take them, but they trust enough to do the follow through in their personal life, their career, and in relationships. And today I have an amazing woman here. She is an author. She's a publisher. She's a book coach. She has a company and her name is Yvonne DeVita. But when we talk about some of these book titles, she's my hero. I just got to admit it. Let's just say it up front. She's my hero. Hi, Hi Ron. <laughs> Hi, I'm so happy to be here. I love, love, love your shirt. Uh, thank you. I, 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 I love pink. Yep, and I love purple. <laughs> I love, I, I, again, I love the courage that it takes. My daughter has the mermaid hair, the rainbow oh, hair. Oh, beautiful. Oh, it's all different colors. And I keep telling her and I tell everybody, you know, I love your hair, but I can't envision it on me. Huh? You know, who knows? Who knows? Who knows? You should you should try one of the ones that wash out just for fun. Mm, don't give me any ideas. Don't leave me unsupervised. That's all I've got to say. Okay. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Yeah. Anything is know. anything is possible at that point. Okay. Mm -hmm. Just unsupervised. I could be in deep trouble. Um, Yvonne, can we talk about your backstory? How you yeah. started to get into all of this? Let's do that. Yes, because it's really, people tell me, wow, what a, what a great story. Here's the thing. I have always been a writer, wrote my first novel in seventh grade. And um, it was what I was going to be when I grew up. Well, then I grew up and I got published um, articles and some short stories and whatnot. But then, you know, I became mom and I became a housewife and I stayed home. But I always still wanted to return to it. So when I got divorced, which happens to a lot of us, I decided that um, I was learning more and more about the Internet and about what people did on the Internet. And I noticed that women at that time in 2005 were really starting to shop a lot online because it was convenient. They didn't have to put all the kids in the car, go to the mall. They could just uh, do it in their pajamas, you know, after dinner. And I said, why aren't people marketing to women who shop online? And so I thought, I'm going to write a book about that. And a friend of mine um, at the time, we were bouncing around ideas about how I could write this book. And I said, I want to take people out of the 1950s, that Dick and Jane world that we grew up in where... Dick had all the power. And I said, Jane has grown up and she has a lot of power now. In fact, women make the majority of the decisions in the home about what gets bought, right? Mm -hmm. Aren't we the ones that do the shopping? Even if our husbands come with us, who makes up the grocery list? Mom or the wife. So I said, I want to write a book that gets, gets us out of that Dick and Jane world. So I did. I wrote a book called Dickless Marketing. And <laughs> it was about marketing to Jane. And guess what? It got him a lot of attention. Oh, I imagine. Because that was back in 2005. And, and yes. that's women, that's unheard of in business. No, it, it is. And so... I got interviewed on a local TV station and the reporter said to me, well, um, you can hold the book up and you can say the title, but I can't. <laughs> so I had to say, okay, Dickless Marketing. It's about Dick and Jane. I don't know what everybody else thinks it's about. <laughs> but uh, in the end, the book led me to starting my own publishing company because I'd used print on demand and that was a pretty new technology back then. Not a lot of people knew what it was. It wasn't being used in a lot of places, but I knew about it. And because the book was about the internet, I knew it had to come out right away. It couldn't wait two years for a traditional publisher to publish it. So I used print on demand. The company I worked with who will remain nameless was awful. 
They, they ruined um, the cover. They ruined the inside of the book. They did such a poor job. My husband had to take it in, my, my second husband, he had to take it in and fix the interior so that it was correct. We had to create the cover ourselves. And I said to myself, this is really a poor experience. And I, I don't think authors should have to go through this. I'm going to start a company where they don't have to do that. So we started um, researching on how to make that happen. And lo and behold, we found out that Dickless Marketing was being printed right around the corner. <coughs> in our house. Really? So we could drive 15 minutes to the printer that was printing the book that I wrote through this other publishing company. So we took the book back in-house and we republished it under our name. And um, that was the 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 beginning of Windsor Media Enterprises, my publishing, print on demand publishing company. And I published, I think it was about 20, 25 titles, um, mostly business books, but not all business books. And I worked with women especially because I really feel strongly in helping women get their voice um, out into the world. And lo and behold, that led to starting a blog. And so I have a blog called Lipsticking. And Lipsticking comes from chapter two of the book where I, I say, if you're going to make a promise with your lips, it ought to stick. <laughs> and so um, <laughs> Lipsticking got me uh, speaking engagements. And on one speaking engagement, I was introduced to the interactive marketing director of Nestle Purina, the pet food company. And so I said to him, I know that more women than men have pets and you should have a blog because women are looking to bloggers today to find out where they should shop, what they should buy. Bloggers are becoming very influential. And he said, well, uh, the lawyers won't let us blog. So again, this was like 2007, maybe after the book had been out a, a year or two. And I said, well, hey, I'll blog for you. <laughs> OK, you can sponsor me and I'll be the blogger. So I started a pet blog called Scratchings and Sniffings. <laughs> and I started writing about pets and I started um, they introduced me to a veterinarian on their staff and he wrote, wrote content also. So. During that time, I met another pet blogger and she said, we should do something together. She said, there's a lot of other pet bloggers out there. And I thought, OK, look, what do you want to do? And I don't know how familiar you or or the viewers would be um, with Blog Her. Blog Her was the premier um, women's blogging network. Thousands and thousands of women bloggers belong to Blog Her. And I know the founders. I had been to all of their conferences and I had spoken at their conferences. And so we said, let's do that. Let's do that for the pet bloggers. And uh, we all looked at each other and said, have you ever put on a conference? <laughs> not me, no. Have you ever put on a conference? No, not me either. And I actually went out and asked a couple of, of other people, smart people, and said, do you want to do this with us? We're going to have a conference and blah, blah, blah. And they said, no, that's the wrong way to do it. Don't do that. Don't do that. You'll fail. And I said, I'm going to do it. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to fail. And so we did it. We were a big success. We had a check in our hand before we even had a bank account. And for the next 10 years, I worked in blog pause. Um, I closed Windsor Media down. I was a pet in, in the pet influencer space. I was in charge of the speakers and our pet awards program. And then it got acquired by a bigger company that didn't take it in the kind of right direction. So Tom and I retired and we came back to our roots. And coming back to our roots led us to Amazon KDP Publishing. So mm -hmm. I no longer publish. Uh, what I do is I coach and I edit and we do all of the cover design and all of the back cover and we advise our authors on marketing and then we get it up on Amazon for them. So it's kind of come full circle. <clears throat> I love that. But the thing was, is I love the fact that you, t you came up with a solution, wrote a book about it, mm -hmm. and, and I... I'm all about the blind spots. Mm -hmm. And right now I'm uh, talking with, uh, uh, preparing a speech on society norms mm -hmm. and how it affected my life as I grew up. That's and, fascinating. 
And so in that, um, I'm, I'm preparing for a TEDx talk Excellent. and that's going to be my talk. But in all of this, it is society norms and I'm in my sixties. So I was a kid in the sixties mm -hmm. and there was so much craziness and chaos and going on. It was, it was, I didn't know what to think about it as a kid. I was just like, women are burning their bra. What, what's a bra? What, why, why are they burning it? You know? <laughs> and so the fact was, is, you know, you know that very few women burn their bras. Well, was, I, and I agree, you know, but you know, it's what you saw on TV. It, it was, it was very uh, full of women's rights. And then there were the race riots. And then there were people who finally women and black people who were standing up and saying, we count, we want our voices heard. Mm -hmm. And, it, it's absolutely true that um, some of the women went a little far, but mm -hmm. for the most part, we what we wanted to do was make sure our daughters didn't have to grow up and be exposed to the kinds of um, bad experiences that we had. So I, I'm with you. I, um, I look at my daughters and I'm glad that the world that they live in, they don't have to, they just still do. It's still happening. Um, There's a lot of same things still happening. And yeah. we're talking, we're talking 50 years later. Exactly. And it's sad. It's very sad. But um, more and more women are feeling empowered. to. Well, it's, it's, you know, I read this book and it's called the Divine Sophia. Mm. And it's the writings of, Jesus Christ, Mary Magdalene, and Isis. And it, it talks about the archaeological sites over in Istanbul and Egypt and Syria and Iran, where they have found effigies of statues where women were as important as men mm -hmm. at one point in time. And I was like, wow. And then they go to show that how they tried to start organized religion and they wanted the power, the control, and the greed. Well, that's all very masculine. Yes. So they had to demonize somebody. So, yes. you know what? They had to create the story. I, Eve never ate the apple in Eden. And the story never existed. It was something they wrote to demonize women. Yes, it's, a, it's, it's part of the myth. And it's part of um, the stories that we learn as children. Right. Centuries. We're talking centuries of well, stories. In yeah. to society's norms, mm -hmm. girls are supposed to be quiet and girls are not good at math and girls shouldn't <laughs> do this and blah, blah, blah. And boys, you know, should protect us because we need protecting. And in the end, what that um, what that did is it, it really sort of damaged those of us who were growing up there and, and thought that was true. I was fortunate. I was very fortunate. My mother um, was a very strong woman and she had her own business. She went out and got a loan to open a little grocery store and she ran the corner grocery store um, the whole time I was growing up. And I learned from her that you can take charge of your own life mm -hmm. and you don't have to be silent. I agree. But the fact is, is so many women don't. And it depends yeah. on where you live mm -hmm. and how back roots it is or mm -hmm. how, how rural it is. Mm -hmm. It takes on a different meaning. And I was just like, wow, I lived in Wyoming and, and, mm -hmm. You know, I grew up in Colorado, you know, back in the day. And, and it was like, OK, you know, in the 70s. A girl could get raped and they blamed it on her because of the clothes she wore. Oh, yes. And also, if, if you were going to um, I mean, this was a, a common refrain. If, if you're you're going to rob a woman, you might as well rape her, too, because you won't get charged for the rape. So, well, the thing is, is most women don't report it because they're so ashamed that somehow because of their culture, their traditions, their programming and indoctrinations in the family stories that, you know, you, you contributed to it somehow, some way. Right. And so the fact, the bottom line is, is that's why those family secrets were so devastating. And so there was a lot of reasons why people did what they did in the 60s. Mm -hmm. And it was breaking beyond what society was being forced to do. Mm -hmm. with the wars. Yes. And so, but with that, I love the fact that I love your voice. I love the fact that you're willing to speak out and you spoke out in a time when it wasn't okay to do so. Right. 
it was it was really comical though because um i would say to people this is about dick and jane remember dick and jane and they'd be oh yeah okay <laughs> i mean and, and the, the funny thing to me was they could use all sorts of language and in, in refer to like women's breasts and women in movies that, that, that uh, partial nudity was okay but god forbid you should say something like the word dick yeah. In re reference to a man, no, that is. To this day, you will not see a naked man on the films. There's, you won't see it to this day. Well, there are some. There, there are a lot. There well, are I'm not lot. talking about pornography. I'm talking about. No, no, no. On, regular, on some regular films, there are, there's male nudity. They don't show full frontal very often. And I don't care. I don't care about women either. To me, it, the context of when they have the clothes on or off is irrelevant. It's I'm I'm watching the story and I'm watching the, the plot line and whatnot. And they don't need to take the clothes off either one of them. So it's I it, it annoys me when I see so many um films that do have a lot of naked women because you know why it's for the, the guys. Mm -hmm. so I, Agreed. That was my next point. It was like you don't see it. I mean, it's rare, but you don't see it as much as you do. And for some reason, it's it's that um, oppressing women, and they figured this yeah, is because, the way you can get the message out. Because because the director or whoever the producer of the film can say, well, if you're not willing to do this, then we'll get someone else. They would never say that to a man. Mm -hmm. They would never tell a male star, movie star, that he had to do this. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It's changing, and it's changing, and I love the change. But in your the company that you had, you also are a coach. Yes. And in that, how do you coach your, your clients? You know, as far as like writing the books, marketing them, the mm -hmm. storytelling. Can we talk yeah. about that? So here's, here's the thing. Um, I recognized this time around that people needed help, not just writing the book, but kind of being accountable to themselves, understanding that they're writing a nonfiction book, which is probably about them and their business, but it isn't a report. So I say to them all the time, well, I see in this page where you describe something that happened, but where's the story? I want to hear how you felt when this was happening. I want to hear where you were. What was in the room? Was it cold? What Did they serve um, coffee? What was happening? The reader needs to be engaged with the story of what you're telling and not just the fact that it happened. So what I do is I help them get the story right. What story should you be telling in the book? How many different stories should you be telling? And then which stories are you going to then pull out and use as talking points when you're interviewed about the book? We talk about the fact that the book has to have a good cover. It has to have a good back cover. Um, it has to have storytelling <clears throat> inside and it's a tool. If it's a nonfiction book that you're writing for your business, you're writing it because you want to teach people something. You want to um, share a message with them. You want to build a community. So then what can you do? Can you take it and build workshops and webinars and uh, mastermind groups? Can you use it to um, get bigger and better speaking engagements? Yes, all of those things are possible. So at Nurturing Big Ideas, what we do is we help our authors um, write and publish the book and get it up on Amazon, but we also then help them understand the concept of storytelling in nonfiction and the concept of how do I market this now? What does it mean that I have a book? Because you don't write a book, you just put it on the shelf. <laughs> Nobody does that, right? Even a fiction book. I have a fiction author who has a wonderful book, but I said to him, this book was written more, as much to convey the message of the story as it was to entertain people. So let's put a reader's guide in the back of the book for book clubs so they can talk about it. Mm. I, I like that. I, being, I, you know, being an author myself, I, I love that idea. And, and it's not like I've ever seen that before. 
Well, they do a lot now. Readers' guides are becoming pretty common, um, especially in fiction books. So with a nonfiction book, we might recommend that they create a workbook. But um, in fiction books, because book clubs are pretty popular, and I think COVID actually influenced the rise of book clubs online. Mm -hmm. And so having this reader's guide in the back of the book um, helps the book club talk about the book and what what the book is about. And also, we we encourage our, um, our fiction authors to put in the first chapter of their next book because no fiction author just writes one book. <laughs> you don't do that. You're you're out there to build a community, so you're writing more than one book. So let's put the first chapter of your next book in there and get people really excited about it, or entice them. Yes, you know, but that, to put that little hook out there for them to, to snag onto. I love that. I love that. But the thing is, is how many uh, um, in your experience as a publisher in the last twenty years? A lot of people, the, the, the process of, of writing a book, one, is, is top secret. Two, getting it published, even with KDP, it's top secret. You have to do a lot of digging. And if you don't know, it becomes very frustrating to put it together. And to do online is if you're not technology savvy. Right. Right. I, I think what happens is people... Um, they think they can sit down and and type this manuscript up and maybe get a um an editor an outside editor to uh, come in and do at least the editing the interior editing and then they think they can hire somebody maybe their sister's brother's uh, best friend who was a, a graphic designer to make the cover and boom they they can send that manuscript now somewhere and it will get published so the, the offerings are traditional publishing, which is very, very difficult to break into, or hybrid publishing, which is a small publishing house that has their own imprint and will publish the book for a fee. Mm -hmm. Not like the vanity press, presses of old, because these hybrid publishers really do want good books. They're not going to take just any willy-nilly manuscript. And then there's people like myself. And what I do is I don't have an imprint anymore. I'm not a publisher. I will take and I will work with you on that book so that the, the writing is going to be so good that it could stand up to any traditionally published book. We're going to edit it. We're going to make sure everything is correct. And we're going to then, while you're writing the book, it's not top secret. It's get out there and talk about it. Get out there and tell people you're writing it. Get out there and share little bits out of the book. Take pieces right out of the book and put them in front of people. And some of the authors who come to me are like, like, you know, well, I can't, well, that's scary. How can I do that? <laughs> you know, what will happen? A, some of them think some, well, they'll steal my idea. People will steal my idea. And I'm like, well, Here's the truth of the matter. There are no original ideas. So if they're stealing your idea, it doesn't really mean anything. <laughs> and number two, even though it's your idea, the way you're presenting it is going to be so unique that it doesn't matter if somebody else says, hey, that's a good idea. I'm going to go run with that. I don't care. You promote you and your book and your content. And so we take that, that mystery away. And um, we make sure they understand exactly what they need to do, exactly what's going to happen. We prepare months in advance for the book launch. And then we um, work hand in hand. Literally, I do paragraph by paragraph, page by page with them. We talk about why did I change this? What questions did I have about this? Where is the story that belongs here? And we create something that I consider a stellar product that they can use in their business. See, the thing is, is I never knew that that, that resource was available. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, it, it happens. And well, here's the scary thing. So today when people go online and for instance, will search how to publish a book, um, they're going to get a lot of results, right? Mm -hmm. Some of the results are going to be hybrid publishers most of them are going to be hybrid publishers um, because the traditional publishers don't need to do that. 
So in the traditional publishing world, you have to write a proposal and we're talking 50, 60 pages. And the main part of the proposal needs to be how you're gonna market the book because the traditional publisher is not gonna market the book for you, even though people think that's what will happen. <laughs> so all those results are gonna get bad, are gonna be the high, these hybrid publishers. And this, the sad thing is some of them are not that good. Mm. Um, it, it's, it's so how do you choose the right one? I think it's, it's pretty hard because I have two authors right now who chose hybrid publishers who did not do a good job in their books mm. and we're redoing the book for them because it was um, done so poorly. Um, and so I think what, what, um, writers have to do is they really need to look more at more than one number one uh, option whether it's a hybrid or a traditional or whether they find nurturing big ideas and in, in someone like myself who is a book coach um, and they need to understand what happens with the book when it's done because that's a big part of what hybrid publishers in my opinion are not doing they don't help the authors get the book out there the, the two people i'm working with their um publishers sent out a press release. Well, today a press release is not going to really do any help mm -hmm. for a, a new author because if it comes across your desk and you don't know who they are, you are you going to take a chance on them? Probably not. You don't know who this person is. So pub, I don't think press releases are all that effective. What I think is they need to get on podcasts they need to build a community. Yep. We, we actually help them with um, developing a list of beta readers. So the beta readers are their start of their fan club. And we want those beta readers then to support them when the book comes out. I, I love that idea. There's, who, there, who was the guy that did that? He wrote a book and he kept sending it out to people until they, oh God, what is his name? I, I, it's at the tip of my tongue. But he sold so many books Oh, hang on one second. It's right there. It's right, ugh, right there. <laughs> it, it, but he sold so many books, but he didn't stop writing it till everybody read the book. All agreed that it was worth it. Yeah. See. And he went and he went and sold it place by place. He sold almost over a hundred thousand copies at that point in time. Um, it's not. It's not Canfeld. It's um. Um, it's a woo woo kind of book. Oh. It's not chicken soup for the soul. No, no, no. It's not. It's not him. It's uh, something prophecy. I think I want to oh, say. Oh yes, the the Phil the the Philistine prophecy. Something like that. Yes, 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 yes. I know that. And book. I can't. I still can't think of his name. But I thought of that book as you were talking because he did just that. He used his beta readers and yep. kept writing the book and kept sending it out to everybody agreed on each and every chapter. And then that's when he put the book together and he did this back in the, I want to say the eighties. Yes. Yes. It was quite, he was very, very smart. And, and he yeah, it was a journey, but he circumvented all the ordinary yes. processes. Yes. And he probably, well, and that's, one, that's one of the interesting things is when you are so committed to the, the book and the message and you give a whole bunch of them away for free which most authors are like wait i'm in this to make money and i'm here to say you're not going to make any money on this book so mm -hmm. stop thinking about that right now because this book right. is not a money-making project right. um but if you understand that what you do is you create these this, this fan club for yourself and um, you want the content then uh, to be good enough for other people. Because once the author has the book done, they're going to then share it with their clients, their prospects. Mm -hmm. This is what we call book is business card. So instead of giving someone a business card, send them a copy of your book. And guess mm -hmm. what? The business card that's stuck in their pocket and it gets forgotten, mm, the book is not, the book is going to be like my book, How to Write a Book Book. It's, it's <laughs> solid. Book. You, it's It's there and nobody is going to forget that you gave it to them. And see that that's, that's something else a lot of writers don't know. And it's one of those, those golden nuggets that would be keeping them from 
writers want to write. They don't want to think about having to do anything right. else. Right. And so when they write, they're of that passion and, and they got all this, you know, this emotion in the book. Mm -hmm. And then they're so invested in the book. And then when somebody comes in and starts, as I've heard one, but one author said, they picked it apart. They just picked it apart. They took it apart. They rewrote it. And it wasn't my book afterwards. And I said, but was it really your book to begin with? Well, here's the thing. Um, we don't do that and no one should do that. It should be their book. It is their book. However, the goal is the message is for an audience. So we sit down at the beginning and say, who's the audience? And invariably, the new author will say, everybody, everybody should read my book. <laughs> and, and I say, well, that's very nice. But all 9 billion people on the planet are not going to read your book. So let's say <laughs> what particular group of people will read your book. OK, well, my book is aimed at women in business. Well, now we're getting somewhere. Okay, mm -hmm. women in business, that's good. Well, that's still too big. Which women in business? Is this women who have been established in business for 50 years and you've got insight that they can share or learn from? Or is it entrepreneurs? Or is it, um, you know, women who are turning a hobby? And who? Which women is this actually for? So we drill down until we get to the audience. Now, once you do that, you have to say to yourself, okay, where do those people hang out? Because because knowing it isn't any good if you can't get the book in front of those people. And mm -hmm. so once you figure out where you think they hang out, you do some research, you look around um, social media channels and, and see where these people are hanging out. Then you start to think about who your beta readers should be. Because you want your beta readers to be people who hang out in the same space so that they can share. And I think I, I, I really like that idea because the fact is, is, is the one thing I learned in life early in law enforcement, it's not what you communicate. It's what that individual perceives. Yes. Yes. It's exactly. Um, I, I learned that a long time ago too. It's, it's not what I said. It's what you heard. Mm -hmm. And so what, in order to make that um, effective, then you've got to ask them, what did you hear? Mm -hmm. And, and sometimes in a conversation, you have to say, well, here's what I heard. I don't know if this is what you meant, but this is what I heard. So that, oh, well, that's not what I meant. Oh, mm -hmm. so now let's talk about that. So yes, absolutely. Communication is pretty, <laughs> it's, it's pretty one-sided. It's all about what the person heard you say. Yes. And that perception depends on whether they get engaged or not. Mm -hmm. Because if, if there's anything in there that triggers them, there's, I'm not reading this. This is junk. Or if it does trigger him in a way like, oh, my gosh, I used to do that. Yeah. It becomes reflective. It just depends on the individual. That's right. So the fact is, is I want to, you know, being an, uh, I was published back in 1983. I wrote a poem, Cops Are People Too. Oh. And I never knew how it would be so huge in today's date oh, with yeah. everything going on. Yes, I bet it is. Yeah. And so the fact is, is that they're attacking people in a uniform. They don't know who they are. They don't know anything about their family. They could be the, the nicest guy or nicest yep. lady on the planet. But all you do is see the uniform and you're attacking the uniform. Yeah. Well, and I think to, to the point of perception, people take too much, um, rely too much on that perception. We do it with, I mean, so here I am. I have purple hair. OK, <laughs> and uh, I'm kind of an old lady and I go shopping and I cannot tell you uh, how many times in, in the shopping store people will be like. Mm. <laughs> kind of looking at my hair and then they look at me and I'm like, hi, but but then there are the, the people who come up to me and say, I love your hair. I think mm -hmm. your hair is beautiful. So I, I again, it's which is your audience. Yep. Or which is open-minded? Yeah. Well, and, and it's it's um, it's the way you carry it also. So mm -hmm. I don't even remember I have purple hair when I'm out until someone comes up and compliments me. I'm just out there to do shopping. I'm just a lady going to get her groceries. Uh, so when writing a book and sharing a message, mm -hmm. 
I do often with my authors say this particular paragraph could trigger people and this is not what you want in this book because this is not what the book is about. Mm -hmm. if, if your book was about this and your goal is to do that, okay, mm -hmm. fine. But if it's in the book and even if it was um, one paragraph in one of the books I was doing recently, I said, you know, you're making a blanket statement here about one section of the population. And I, I don't think we should do that. So let's change this to something else. And so we did um, because it just you, it's just not a good idea if the book is meant for an audience to be um, educated or, or, you know, build a community and whatnot. In that particular book, that message was not right. And, and but say the thing is, is I love the fact that at least you were there to help them because that could have been a huge catastrophe if that book got published and all of a sudden, you know, he becomes a target of whatever reactions other people are having. Exactly. And exactly. I well, also people, people don't understand Chris that, um, they think it's, the internet has convinced people that all bets are off. Everything is free. I can do and say anything I want. <laughs> well, you can't. You cannot uh, blatantly accuse someone of something in your book. You cannot take a public figure's name and say some of the things. And we have pulled things out of books and said, no, we are not going to go there because mm -hmm. you will get sued and I will get sued. And we would rather not have that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But see, this is the thing is people, they don't realize their opinions is three feet around them. That's as far as it extends. Yeah. So whether you have an opinion, everybody has an opinion, right. whether you like mine or not. The difference is, is, you know what, I'll accept you for your opinion, but I'm not going to judge you for your opinion. Are you right. doing the same or are you judging me? Right. So there's, so, it, and I was, as, as you were bringing this up, I was just like, cancel culture. I'm, oh. I guess I'm an old lady too, because I just don't get, how do you cancel a human being? You can't. You don't. But to think in your mind that that's capable, what else do you think is capable in your mind? Something's skewed here. And the fact is, is that, you know what? I have this attitude and have all my life that I can do anything. But if I choose not to do it, I choose not to do it. It doesn't mean I'm not capable of doing it. Mm -hmm. It's just not my interest. Yeah. And with that, that's a different perspective than, you know what? I can do anything and it doesn't matter what you think or do, I'm going to do as I please. And it doesn't matter who I hurt. Yeah. And that's when there's a problem. Yeah. That's when it gets, you know, and, and I believe that for the most part, most people are good people. Mm -hmm. And I don't think anyone, I mean, I, I've met some people during the last political election where things got really crazy and mm -hmm. people were saying things and whatnot. And, and, in fact, one of my family members got so furious with me. And the truth of the matter is, you know, I said, that's their choice. Mm -hmm. I, I mm -hmm. accept that whatever happened made them angry. It wasn't my intention for that to happen. Mm -hmm. And so then I look back, did, what did I say that made that happen? And then it's my choice going forward. Do I be more careful in that? But at the time, it was like, you know, my daughter was like, Mom, don't let them talk to you that way. And I'm like, why? why what difference does it make? Well, you know, it's, it's not going to change their opinion. No. It's not going to do anything but engage them into their limiting beliefs. Right. And so then at that point, all it does is throw gasoline on a fire. Right, right. And, and so, I said, I'm just but it doesn't even have to be political. It could be any number of things. Absolutely. Nowadays. Absolutely. And, and people are just so triggered by such the simplest things. It's like, wow, you know, you can say no and that not happen. Right. Right. <laughs> you can put it in different words, but people don't realize. And this is the part I want to talk with you about is that words have power. Words have enormous power. So, I mean, there was a poem many years ago um, that the, the pen is mightier than the sword. And 
today people might say, oh, no, that's not true. You know, we have these AR-15 rifles and blah, blah, blah. Then you're missing the message. You're missing the message if you're comparing a, a um, weapon to writing because the reality is the writing will reach more people and could possibly change minds faster than your your weapon or whatever you're talking about. And the point of the matter is that if you have, if you feel you've been wronged, use that, use your voice then to talk about it intelligently mm-hmm. and pull as politely as you can, please, because then people will listen. Mm-hmm. Then people will say, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that. I didn't understand that. I didn't realize that. Whereas if you just go off shouting and screaming, Mm -hmm. you know, suddenly the words that you're shouting and screaming don't matter because no one's listening to them. But they're not going to read it either. They'll, they'll read. It depends on where it is and depends on what it is. My point is that if you're going to write it down in an editorial to the newspaper or on your blog or wherever it is, make sure, you, eight, number one, that you have the facts as, mm-hmm. as well as you can get the facts because they are out there. And number two, keep it um, intelligent. Be intelligent Make it a conversation where you welcome other ideas as long as they're polite. And so, um, you know, I have written in the lipstick and blog I talked about before, I have written posts talking uh, about women's issues and women's rights and things like that. And I invite comments. But I also say, if your comment is off topic or rude or really out, outrageous, I reserve the right to delete it because inviting yeah. you in to talk on my blog is like inviting you into my living room. Mm-hmm. But it's also, the, the, see, this is, this is, I, I love the fact that we're talking about this communication because it's not, you have an opinion and yes, women have been oppressed for centuries. Mm-hmm. Yes. Women are doing jobs they never thought they could do before because other women laid down the footwork for yes. it to happen. So the fact is, is somebody had to start. I met a lady who was a cop back in the fifties and oh, she wow. in, in Connecticut to boot. So it was like a, a oh. mid uh, Eastern state. Yeah. And I was honored to meet her because of what she did made it possible for me. Right. And when you see it that way, that people are putting footprints down for you Mm -hmm. so that you can become this writer, that you can become this editor, you can become this, this speaker, TEDx speaker, whatever your, your genre is, somebody has paved the way for you to be there. Mm -hmm. So I'm not saying you need to bow down to them, but realize that 50 years ago, you wouldn't have any of this. No. We didn't have any of this in our country. So be proud of the people that stood in their power to step out so that people don't have to go through publishers, that they can get their message out. Because how, how long did publishers not take? I mean, let's be honest. How many books do publishers actually take a year? Well, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Um, I can tell you that of the thousands of books that they do take, they, um, you know, so let's say they get approximately, I would say probably a thousand books a day or a thousand manuscripts or proposals. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that may be conservative. I'm not sure. So of that, what's going to happen is they go to a room with five or 10 readers um, who read through them and, and say, well, this is a good one and put it aside for an editor. Okay, so these readers decide mm-hmm. which one of which ones of these manuscripts are going to go to an editor. Now, the editor has to look at the manuscript and decide, can I do anything with this? And of the books that they get, so let's say out of the thousand, um, a hundred get put aside to the editor. So the editor takes 
and there's three editors. So the editors each have 30, 33 books. And so then they go through those manuscripts and they probably pick out two or three. Mm -hmm. And so then they have to go and pitch the publisher. Mm -hmm. The publisher just doesn't automatically say to the editor, oh, you like that book? Okay, let's publish it. Now the publisher decides, okay, are we going to do it? And once it gets to the publisher and the publisher offers you a contract, the publisher wants um, all the rights to the book. They're going to choose the cover. They're going to choose the title. They're going to tell you when the book comes out and they want you to market it. So you've gone through all of this and you may get an advance of a thousand dollars. So writers think they're going to get their book in front of a publisher. They're going to get a $50,000 <laughs> advance and they're going to be rich and famous. And this is not going to happen. So to your point, that's why I recommend print on demand publishing and working with people like myself because I can get you out there. Yes, you're going to pay me a fee for my services and my expertise. You're not paying me to sell your book. I'm not selling your book. What we're doing is we're creating a really great product and you're going to get it in front of people faster. I mean, because the publishing, that whole publishing I, I thing I just told you could take a year. A year and a, usually a year to a year and a half. Well, to just go through and decide, but then once it gets to the publisher, it's another year, year and a half. So mm -hmm. that's why I didn't do when I did Dickless Marketing. I said, no, a year and a half from now, the internet's going to be totally different. Mm -hmm. I've got to get this out in front of people today. Right. And see that you had that foresight and had that knowledge, but it's, I just love this because it's educating people who want to become writers mm -hmm. to learn the process, to know that there's avenues they can go that other people don't think of right. to get their message out there. And it's respected. Let me mm -hmm. tell you this. Okay. Let me tell you a little secret. So I was, I was speaking or I was actually the moderator of a panel at a conference and we were talking about different ways to get published. And so there was a hybrid publisher and there was an agent on the panel. And then there was someone from a traditional publishing and one girl raised her hand and said, I would never self publish because it's, it's not um, respected and people don't take you seriously. And I said, well, okay, L let me ask a question of the entire group. Cause there were like 200 people in this, this, this uh, session. And I said, I want, um, I want you to raise your hand. If you ever looked at who published the book before you bought it. And nobody raised their hand because nobody looks to see who published the book. Mm -hmm. If the book is done right and it's it's a product that has the right cover, the right inside, has all the things that we've been talking about, the average person wants the message in the book. They don't care who published it. Yes. Yes. No one's going to hold to hold you unless it's a it's an it's a lousy book, which as I said, I've got two that I'm doing over. So <laughs> I, I I love that, but it is it it is just that. And I love the fact that, you know, nowadays, not to to um continue on this, but nowadays things are simpler. Where mm -hmm. before you couldn't self-publish. Before it took absolute blood, sweat, and tears, like this gentleman that did the prophets, uh, prophecy, prophecy. Celest or you know, Celest uh, yes. Um, it, well, back in those days, what they did was vanity publishing, mm -hmm. and so in the vanity publishing, you could go to a printer, a particular printer who knew how to put together a book, mm -hmm. and it didn't matter to them what the book looked like, mm -hmm. that's why it was called vanity publishing. So self-publishing today is not like that. Mm -hmm. Self-publishing today has risen above that because myself and other people who do what I do, we want to help authors and writers get this message in front of the right people right now. And see, that's, 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 a, that's just another point why you would really want to work with somebody to get that guidance so yeah. that what you write is complete Yes. And that it is people are willing to invest in it as much as you are. Yes. So I love that. I love that, Yvonne. That is just that is just what I wanted this conversation to be is educational mm -hmm. for people. But again, let's bring reality into it because it has a lot to do what was done before and the things that weren't allowed that are now allowed. It's because of people like you 20 years ago, you know, 
publishing your own book and getting it out there, even though society was like dickless marketing. What does that mean? You know, are you saying the guy's gay? I mean, that was the first thought that went through my head. And then it was like, no, this is to help women. Yeah. And, and so the fact is it, again, because of society norms now that thought process happened. And I was like, wow, I should, I really need to tell her that because the bottom line is, is that it is, it doesn't matter what, what you identify with. Mm -hmm. It's what you get out of it. Right. It's, it, we're all here to help other people. Mm -hmm. We're all here to try and build a community and get messages out and share conversations and share stories. So it all comes back to the stories, Chris. And this is what's so important to me and why nurturing big ideas is different than other people who do what I do, because I am hell bent on making sure that we get some actual stories in the book not just the report of what happened but i want to hear that you cried did you cry tell the reader that you cried because guess what they're crying and so i say did you bleed bleed on the page for me a little bit mm -hmm. show me that emotion because the reader wants to feel connected to you in the same way Mm, I love it. I love it. I love it, Yvonne. Three tips. What three tips could you give any inspiring author to do that they could do that would help them out today? Okay. So whether you're a fiction or a nonfiction author, um, be very careful about the publisher you choose. Read all of the fine print. In fact, even take the contract to a lawyer. I'm sorry. I really would recommend this. Take it to a lawyer and have a lawyer look at it because I'm working with people who were previously published who did not get the kind of services that they should have got that they were promised. No, so that's number one. I'll look at the contract of the publisher you choose. Number two, storytelling. Learn how to tell stories. If you don't know how to tell a story or you think because it's a nonfiction book, it doesn't need a story, that is incorrect. It needs a lot of stories. In fact, it might need more stories because these are people, your, the people in your audience um, want to be connected and engaged with you in the same way that they are um, normally on a day-to-day -day basis. They're looking to you to provide them with something and you have to be human. If you're not human, they're not going to read your book. So, and number three, remember that marketing starts the day you put your pen to paper or your fingers to the keyboard. Because if you don't start telling people that you're writing this book and get the word out by the time the book launches, you will have a mountain to climb when you're trying to market it. I love that. And that is, that is the simple basics of it, but that is to know that to get started with, it could change your perspective. And I, and I love that. Thank you, Yvonne. So here we go. I asked this of every one of every one of my interviewees to sit back, close their eyes and connect with their inner child, five-year-old inner child. And what would she say of you today? Well, she would say all of the stuff that happened to you made you better. But she also says you never gave up. You didn't care what anybody else thought. You just took the path ahead and yeah. trudged forward. Over and over. Yep. I didn't say I, there, there's, you know, it's like when we started blog pause and we were like, we don't know how to put on a conference, but we're going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And we did. That's what and I tell people do it, do it, find a way and do it. Yes, That's why blogs are so popular now. But the thing is, is somebody thought outside of the box yeah. and did amazing stuff. Yeah, I agree. Yvonne, it's been my pleasure. I am honored. I am so, I was so excited when you talked about author and, and publisher and I was like, oh, okay, we're going to have to pick her brain. We're going to have to pick her brain. And, but I wanted to talk about your books. It, the first one is, um, well, Dickless Marketing. Dickless Marketing. <clears throat> right. And that's old and you can't, I don't think it's even, um, 
It's and still available on, on Amazon. I Amazon says it. Well, let me tell you a secret about Amazon. So Amazon says it's available, but they probably don't have any copies printed because nobody really buys it. So if you were to order it, it would take longer than the two days, even if you have Prime, because they would have to print some <laughs> copies. I mean, in print on demand, they don't print one copy when someone orders it. They print um, um, 5, 10, 15, 20, depending on how popular the book is. And when those run out, then they print some more. So right. it's print on demand that. So in my second book, um, my most recent book is the How to Write a Book book. And it talks it. about all of the things that we talked about here today. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being here today. And thank I again, for having me. Absolutely. Hang on just one second. It takes a special kind of individual to dream their dreams, their thoughts and ideas and turn it into reality. But it also takes courage to step out beyond the society norms that people all govern themselves by and become that pioneer and step out beyond the social norms. Yvonne DeVita, you stepped past your fears. You stayed the course. You had the courage to do the follow through to the end. You are my hero. But Yvonne DeVita, you've championed yourself. Now we know who you've become. Thank you for sharing all of your ideas, your thoughts, your information, and your knowledge with me and my audience today.